Okay, this is Professor Mulcahy again, talking about hemorrhagic disorders of pregnancy and RH incompatibility. These are disorders that are marked by vaginal bleeding, um, hemorrhage disor hemorrhagic disorders. We are not going to open the discussion for spontaneous abortion, ectopic pregnancy, or molar pregnancy. It's just sort of more content than you would need. We're going to focus on placental abruption and placenta previa. So these are the two types that we'll be discussing today. We have placenta previa, um, where the placenta partially or completely covers the opening of the cervix, known as the os. Um, and that is dangerous because as the cervix starts to open, even just a tiny little bit, think about how much blood flow goes through a placenta. You're perfusing an entire human being, and now there's free flow. It's going out through your vagina and onto the floor. <clears throat> um, and we have another disorder, which is known as placental abruption. And for some reason, Saunders and all the other NCLEX books and Passpoint love to try and get you to know the difference between previa and abruption. They're both bad. Um, there's both bad outcomes. In the abruption, the placenta separates from the uterine wall before the delivery of the baby. So we'll differentiate, but keep in mind that both types cause vaginal bleeding. Both can cause massive hemorrhage and both can get everybody dead. Um, you can have a dead mom and a dead baby. So let's first discuss placenta previa. And you can kind of see this picture. <clears throat> I really wish my um, touch screen would work a little bit better, but it doesn't. Um, let's go back in time to slide there. Um, but you can see that picture. A marginal means that there's a corner that covers the os. Complete means the placenta is directly over the os. Low lying doesn't even count as a placenta previa. Um, it's just when the placenta is lower in the uterus. The normal spot for implantation is up here somewhere. Um, we do see more placenta previa after a woman has had uterine surgery, especially cesarean section, because there's scar tissue. And usually with that low uterine incision right here, um, that can be a place where the placenta wants to implant. Um, but placenta previa, if a woman's going for a routine prenatal care and she gets an ultrasound at 20 weeks, she could find out that she has a previa as an incidental finding. And then we have really good information and we can advise mom about the signs and symptoms and we can um, maybe get her to take it easy and take a rest so that she doesn't have massive bleeding. Or maybe she didn't see it on ultrasound or she didn't go for prenatal care or she went for prenatal care but didn't show up to the appointment, whatever the story was, she comes to the ER or the OB triage and she presents with painless, bright red bleeding in large amounts. Um, the typical picture of what placental previa bleeding looks like. I had a patient once who called me to the room. She was a known previa and she said, I think I wet the bed. And I look and her sheets are saturated with bright red blood. Well, we had a baby that night, <clears throat> um, but that's the typical presentation with a previa. It's painless, bright red bleeding in large amounts. The only safe way to have a baby with the placenta previa is through the abdomen because the baby can't come through this placenta and still live. It's just not safe. The first episode of bleeding in a placenta previa is usually a self-limiting thing. It's sort of a warning sign um, and we have time to act. Sometimes it doesn't stop, um, but usually she'll get a big gush or a big episode of bleeding where she's soaking pads um, or blood's running out onto the floor or onto the bed. Um, and then it resolves a little bit and we have some time um, so that we can sort of get her baby ready to be delivered. Second bleeding episode, usually most docs don't have any tolerance for this. They'll just deliver the baby via C-section. So that is placenta previa. So how do we take care of people with placenta previa? Nothing in the vagina, no vaginal exams. This is a case where, remember we said sex was okay during pregnancy. Well, now it's not. Um, pelvic rest. Speculum exam only. Somebody presents to the emergency room or to the OB triage and they've got vaginal bleeding in late pregnancy. You do not ever, ever examine them manually. Um, you can open up the vaginal walls with speculum um, and look at it that way. If your woman is actively, your patient is actively bleeding, we're going to follow the principles um, for any, any type of hemorrhage. Um, we're going to maintain hemodynamic stability. We're going to replace fluid volume, and we're going to try and stop that bleeding if we can. So 
the first thing we're going to do is make sure that she has large bore IV access. Um, placenta previa, you know, you can exsanguinate in minutes. Um, so preferably we would have two 18 gauge or bigger IVs. You get what you can, um, but at least two ways to access, you know, IV, two IV accesses. Then you want to do volume expanders. You're going to bolus her to replace fluid volume. That's also an important part of managing any hemorrhage. So the agents we usually use for that are LR or normal saline because they expand the fluid volume. And we're probably going to give her a nice big fat bolus of a liter or so. Um, while we're drawing the IV, we might as well get some labs. We need a CBC. We need to find out what her hemoglobin and hematocrit are, and we want a type and screen so that we can cross match and have products ready as a, they, you know, as soon as we need them, in case she needs to be transfused. And we want frequent monitoring of vital signs. So mom's vital signs will deteriorate in proportion to the amount of bleeding you're seeing. She could lose two liters and you'll see a drop in the blood pressure and an increase in the heart rate. Usually the heart rate goes up first and then the blood pressure drops. Um, eventually the sat will get lower, but you know, her pulse ox will go lower, but you know, you kind of look at those things. <clears throat> and of course we're going to monitor the baby because if mom's losing blood, baby's losing oxygen as well. So that's some of the care that we're going to want to give to a patient with placenta previa. Now, if she's had her first bleed and it resolves, we can try expectant management for a while. Bed rest. We don't want this mom up and moving around. Um, you know, it's one of those things you just don't want to take the risk that she's going to start moving and maybe the cervix dilates a little bit more or there's a little more stress and she starts bleeding again. So we're going to put her on bed rest. We're going to monitor vital signs at least every four hours. More often, if you have a concern, if she lost a lot of blood and she's post-transfusion, you're going to monitor vital signs to make sure she's got hemodynamic stability and she's not in shock. Um, IV fluids, we're going to maintain fluid volume and replace whatever she lost. Make sure there's always blood products available to you, so maintain a current type and cross match. Um, at my institution, they're good for 72 hours. They even tell you right in the CPOE, the physician's ordering thing when they expire and they can automatically generate a label so that you know to draw it, but you're going to want to maintain that. <clears throat> you're going to monitor mom closely for any signs of bleeding or uterine contractions, which could precipitate bleeding. You watch this mom like a hawk because she'll do something bad to you, guaranteed. And you'll, when you're least expecting it, when you're having the worst shift of your life. Um, and then because we're anticipating preterm delivery a lot of times with this patient, um, there's going to be a point where the baby is safer out than in. Um, we're going to prepare that fetus with magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. It's associated with decreased risk of cerebral palsy and bleeding in the brain. And we're also going to give beta methasone to get the lungs ready. So steroids help improve lung maturity. <clears throat> That's in the preterm labor video. But if you're only watching this one, just know that that's true. So they help the lungs mature and they protect the fetal brain. Now let's compare previa and abruption. Previa is painless bright red bleeding. Abruption is dark red bleeding in smaller amounts. And that's because the baby's head is acting like, or the presenting part of any kind is acting as a cork. So all the blood is pooling up behind the baby. With a previa, you have an apparent blood loss that looks large. In an abruption, it looks smaller, although it may be larger. You just can't detect it. It's obscured. In a previa, it's painless. In an abruption, it's moderate to severe pain. Um, maternal vital signs with a previa will be consistent with what you see, but in an abruption, they will probably deteriorate even when what you're measuring or weighing or looking at is, it looks like a small amount of blood. Um, again, it's because the blood is pulling up behind the baby. <clears throat> now, previa is apparent on ultrasound, but an abruption, ultrasounds are unreliable. They don't really show you that the patient is having an abruption. So now let's talk more about placental abruption now that I've compared those two concepts. Placental abruption is when the placenta, look over here at this picture, um, starts to shear off of the uterine wall 
So what happens is the blood starts to connect, maybe a corner lifts up, um, usually due to vasospasm or abdominal trauma. And then blood pools like a hematoma beneath the placenta. And then it makes it even worse. It starts shearing off more of that placenta. As that placenta separates, a couple things happen. Number one, mom starts to hemorrhage. Number two, the organ that gave baby every bit of oxygen and nutrients that he needs is, is no longer attached to mom. So he's got no perfusion at all. The causes of uh, placental abruption, um, some of them are unknown. Some of them have multiple factors involved. But the two big, big ones that you have to remember are any kind of abdominal trauma. So if mom's been in a car accident, if she's a uh, victim of intimate partner violence, if she fell on her belly, um, somebody threw, I, I think we had a rule out abruption once, she went to a baseball game and a foul ball hit her in the belly. Any kind of abdominal trauma can cause that placenta um, to start to separate. And then we have um, a problem that occurs when we have repeated episodes of vasospasm or very exaggerated episodes of vasospasm. Um, and you can see that with preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is a big risk factor. And you can see it with ingestion of certain substances. Smokers have a great big risk of uh, uh, placental abruption um, because they tend to engage in that behavior several times a day. And each time they have a little vasospasm and the placenta is probably not as vascular as it could be anyway, the blood vessels probably aren't as well developed. And so one of those times the placenta starts to separate, um, cocaine. Oh, wow. When cocaine was big about 15 years ago in the early two thousands and mid two thousands, before the opioid crisis sort of took over, um, we were seeing a lot of placental abruption, um, because cocaine really spikes the blood pressure and really causes that exaggerated vasospasm. Um, that can lead to abruption. Amphetamines, same thing, especially methamphetamine, crystal meth. Um, people who have those substance use disorders, you will see a higher incidence of placental abruption. And their rates of death are much higher if they do abrupt. Um, preeclampsia or even chronic hypertension, if it leads to um, poor development of the placenta and vasospasm on top of that, we can see higher rates of placental abruption. And then the rest of the cases are unknown or multifactorial. We don't really know why they all happen, um, but that's placental abruption. So signs and symptoms, painful dark red bleeding in smaller amounts than a previa. We said it twice, now three times. Um, the blood pools behind the presenting part. You get a trickle instead of a gush. We used to call it the positive shoe sign. I had one nurse who told me that at her hospital, they called it the positive hair sign because people would come in after doing cocaine all night and their hair would be all over the place. Um, but you get that trickle of dark red blood. It's old blood um, because it's got to move past the presenting part, the baby, and it kind of trickles down her leg. You see increased uterine activity. So if you guys ever take stop the bleed training um, or when you learn about how to manage any kind of external bleeding, you know that one of the biggest interventions we do is, you know, put pressure on the bleeders. Um, the uterus tries to do the same thing. It contracts to put pressure on the blood vessels that are like oozing out, you know, all these liters every minute of mom's blood. Um, so we'll see increased uterine activity. It starts off with just irritability and then it progresses to like hypertonic till you get like a rigid board-like abdomen. Um, later stages, we see maternal hemodynamic instability. Um, the pulse is the first thing to go. It'll, you'll see tachycardia. And it'll start as sinus tack, but sometimes they go into other rhythms. Um, and then you see the blood pressure drop. Eventually you start to see signs of cardiovascular collapse and maternal shock. And it can happen quicker than you think. Um, so you need to recognize the signs and you need to act quickly. Fetal distress. Babies really don't tolerate this well, obviously. You know, you're taking away their oxygenation. Um, and so we see a certain pattern on the monitor, which is my next slide. I'm just going to put it up and show you real quick. It's called sinusoidal and it's a smooth, they have absent variability, something you'll learn later. Um, and there's like this undulating wave-like pattern and it's a sign of fetal anemia. Um, and then you'll see absence of fetal heart tones because they can't live without a placenta. So that's a sinusoidal pattern and you can see it's really smooth and then it undulates very regularly. That's a baby that's going, help me, help me, I'm dying. 
Um, that is a category three strip. We will learn about one, two, and three. One is normal, three is definitely not normal, two is anything in between. This baby is dying right on the monitor. Okay, so classifying placental abruption, I'm gonna do this really quickly, and I'm gonna call your attention to this picture. Um, if I had my other app, I would make it bigger just by spreading my fingers out. Um, but this is what they call a grade zero or no symptoms. Um, really nobody's at risk here. Uh, you might even get like a corner of the placenta lifting up, but nothing else has happened yet. <clears throat> grade or grade one for placental abruption is this baby here. And you can see the baby starting to look a little gray, not quite as pink as this baby. Um, and you can see this little area in here where, you know, a corner of the placenta lifted up and now it's bleeding into there. Again, this is a very vascular organ. It's meant to perfuse an entire human being. And so a lot of blood, th blood flow is going through that organ. In grade one, our symptoms are kind of mild. Um, mom's vital signs are stable. Baby's heart rate is stable at the moment. But if it goes anywhere else, we're in trouble. We get to grade two. And that's that third picture over here. Now, baby's really not looking so good. He's kind of a yucky shade of gray. And you can see that blood sort of pooling underneath the placenta. Um, at this point, you have a partial separation. So maybe you're half on, half off. <clears throat> you have an elevated maternal heart rate. So she's tachycardic. At the moment, her blood pressure is stable. And the only reason it's stable, she's lost enough blood. If she were not pregnant, um, she would be in the toilet. But because she has that extra 40 to 50% of circulating blood volume that we learned about in, I don't know, three or four videos ago, she can hold the pressure for a little bit. At this point, we describe the uterus as irritable, and we don't mean it's cranky. We mean it's starting to contract, um, and she might start to get into a hypertonic pattern. And that's the uterus trying to put pressure on those bleeding vessels right there. It's the only thing it has. It's trying to compress the source of the bleeding and control the bleeding because the uterus, if mom dies, the uterus dies too. Um, and at this point, mom's fibrinogen level, she starts to get coagulopathies. Um, so fibrinogen, because she's trying to clot and then she runs out of clotting factors and then fibrinogen, which helps form clots, starts to drop. Now she's in serious trouble. Um, this can lead to a condition known as DIC. I'm going to circle it for, oh, there it is. DIC or disseminated intravascular um, coagulopathy. And that's serious. I'll touch on it briefly. I don't want to make a big thing out of it. Um, it's rare, thankfully. But her fibrinogen levels start to drop. Now, grade three, complete separation. The placenta at this point is free floating. It's like debris in the ocean. Um, we have frequent hypertonic contractions or a rigid board like abdomen where we're in state of like constant contraction. Um, we get serious coagulopathies. Mom is running out of clotting factors. At this point, mom can go into shock such that she ends up in a cardiovascular collapse. She can end up in that DIC. What happens with DIC is mom is going to try to clot. She's going to have an increase in clotting factors. And then all of a sudden she uses them all up and everything drops and she starts bleeding from every orifice internally and externally, and she can die. Death is possible at this point. Also, there's a condition your book refers to. I'm not writing it down because I'm not going to make a test question out of it, but it's called cuvillar uterus if you ever hear of it. Um, and what it means is that the uterine muscle has been deprived of oxygen for so long that it is no longer um, viable. It can be, it's hysterectomy is the only cure for that. Okay, so management of placental abruption, not that different from management of placenta previa in the sense that we're still trying to stop the bleeding, we're trying to maintain circulating volume, and we're trying to maintain hemodynamic stability. So all three of those things are happening. We get the large bore IV access, two access points. Um, is the bare minimum. If you need help, you call for help. And the reason that we want two points is if we're giving blood through one, we can't give anything else. Um, we need a different access. Um, and volume expanders. We're going to want um, our lactative ringers, I think, is our flavor uh, at Capital Health. Other people might use normal saline. Either or, it's fine. If normal saline is what you have, use normal saline, especially if you think you might have to give blood because that's the only fluid compatible with it. You know, you're going to get those baseline labs, the H&H &H clotting factors, very important. 
um, PT, PTT, INR, fibrinogen, and fibrin split products. Um, you're going to get a type and cross match, and you're going to let the blood bank know, hey, I, I got a situation here. Can you please make sure that you have type specific blood for this mom? Um, you're going to monitor. You're going to monitor mom for hemodynamic stability, vital signs frequently. I mean, that cuff is going to be off. You know, if it's an electronic cuff, you're going to cycle it as much as you can or as much as you have to. We're going to assess uterine activity. We're not just going to rely on the monitor because monitors are only as good as the people who put them there. We're going to feel with our hands and our hands are going to give us really good information. But we do want the data from the fetal monitor. So we will put her on the monitor. Um, and we also want to see fetal heart rates. FHR stands for fetal heart rates. We want to see is baby maintaining a baseline? Is he category one or she category two or category three? Um, we want to know if they're headed toward that sin sinusoidal pattern. And then after that, they usually go into like a terminal Brady and then there's nothing. Um, so we want to monitor fetal heart rate. We might start out with a grade one where we've got some time to get things started, or we might be in a grade two or grade three situation and we have to really act fast. Um, for monitoring, you might need a CVP line. And this patient, if they lose enough blood, they bought a ticket to the ICU. Aren't you lucky to be that nurse with no maternity training? But anyway, 90% of these babies need to be born by cesarean. You can attempt a vaginal delivery in a grade one abruption if everything else is stable, but most of the time you're gonna opt for cesarean. Why lose time? Why take a chance? Um, we give cryoprecipitate if fibrinogen is low. Trans, transexamic acid or TXA is like the hot new thing where I am. It's really not even that new. It's maybe five years old. Um, but that does seem to reverse a lot of the coagulopathy. Um, and it can help mom uh, sort of mitigate some of that blood loss. So we'll give that. Um, and then be prepared to administer blood products as well to give her back her hemoglobin and all those other things. So packed red cells could be part of your management there. Okay, so now we're done with the um, abruption versus previa debate, and we're on to RH factor incompatibility, which is a relatively simple concept. We kind of touched on it in normal prenatal care. It affects RH negative mothers, so your O negative, A negative, AB negative, whatever. RH negative mothers with RH positive babies. Now, if her babies are all RH negative, it's not a problem. Um, but if her babies are RH positive, this is a real issue. The first pregnancy, generally speaking, is unaffected. Okay, so mom forms the antibodies against that baby's blood type at delivery when there's maybe a little mixing of fetal and maternal blood, um, when she's exposed to the fetal blood, you know, at delivery. After that, her RH positive fetuses can be affected. Those maternal antibodies will attack the fetal blood cells. And then we see hemolysis, which is those red blood cells opening and bursting. And we see a condition called high drops fatalis because the baby has no hemoglobin. The heart can't function effectively. High drops fatalis looks like congestive heart failure, but in a fetus and not a born human. Um, so you see a lot of edema. Um, and it's a sign that the heart is failing, basically. And that's from massive hemolysis. If the baby is born alive, baby will have severe jaundice or hyperbilirubinemia. Bilirubin is that yellow pigment that's in all the red blood cells. Um, and as they were hemolyzed, they released the, the bilirubin in levels that the baby couldn't handle. So what do we do? We treat prophylactically with Rogam. Every mother at about 24 to 28 weeks gestation, somewhere in there, she's seeing the doctor once a month or the midwife or the clinic, wherever she's going. Um, and we give her a shot of Rogam. There are other brand names for it. Rofilac is the one that we use where I am. Um, it's an IM injection. She gets it then. And then she comes and she has her baby. And within 72 hours of delivery, we give her another shot of the same stuff. Now, if it's Rofilac, um, which is a specific brand, it can be given IV, but in most cases, it's gonna be given IM. Injection into a large muscle like the ventrogluteal. Um, and we do that so that the antibodies don't have time to form. It's an immunoglobulin. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way, may have problems with Rogam because it is derived from blood products, but a lot of them don't. I mean, that's sort of a, 
It's a religious or cultural thing that might affect your care of the patient. Also, anytime that mom has abdominal trauma, we're going to give that shot of Rogam just in case there was any separation of the placenta and any exposure to blood cells that might make mom form antibodies. She also needs to get it at, at the end of every pregnancy, no matter how it ends. So if she has a miscarriage, a stillbirth, um, <clears throat> an ectopic, whatever it is, if there's any chance she could form antibodies against an RH positive fetus, she gets Rogam. Um, if you get hemolytic disease in the newborn, you treat it with an exchange transfusion. And also there's phototherapy lights, but phototherapy won't do enough. Um, exchange transfusion means that you take, basically you have to take all of the baby's blood out and replace it, um, with blood that does not, that has not reacted to those antibodies. And that is the end of our lecture. Thank you very much for staying tuned. I'll see you on the next one.